welcome to the worship service of the First Baptist Church of Marion, Illinois. Located just two blocks west of Tower Square near downtown Marion, this vibrant and energetic church meets weekly for high-energy, Christ-centered services. Enjoy the warm fellowship of the First Baptist family. We pray God's Spirit will be evident in our service and that you will want to come and see what First Baptist of Marion is all about. Absolutely. Let's pray together. Father, you are absolutely worthy. And we didn't just sing those words. We meant them, Lord, from the depths of our heart. We are here to worship you and to show our love for you and to you, Lord. Let these be regarded by you in spirit and in truth to be our love songs to you. Because, Lord, we love you because you first loved us. So, Father, be with us during this worship time. I pray for each and every person that's watching by television today, for each person that's in the auditorium, Lord. May the words that come through your messengers, through the worship leaders, the choir, Father, may it all work together for good today. And may it all lift up the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we are so glad that you are here today. Uh, let me just take a moment to uh, share with you what's going to happen here tonight. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, Troxels are going to sing, and that's worth coming out for. 
But I'm going to sing a song uh, dedicated to Brian and his family uh, tonight, uh, and it's entitled, Knowing What I Know About Heaven. And so uh, that's all you get. You'll have to come tonight, get that. But second thing that's going to happen is we have one of our international missionaries going to be here tonight. And we're going to rearrange the stage, and we're going to do a missionary interview service tonight. And she is going to be sharing uh, the work that she's doing. Her name is Judy Miller, and uh, she actually is a member of First Baptist Church of Marion, came out of this church, and has been an international missionary for all of these years. Some of you know her well. And so she's going to be here tonight, and I am looking so forward to that. And you being here to uh, just give her a little encouragement uh, for being here. But right now... We are going to fellowship a little bit. We're going to shake some hands, welcome our guests to this service. So find our guests, welcome them, and, and uh, to here to First Baptist Church of Marion, Illinois. That's why we bow down and worship this king. It's easy to get into that rhythm and, and, and have such a great time, but those words are so serious. That's why we bow down, because he gave everything for you, for me, for Byron, for whomever calls upon his name. We're going to sing a song, Lord, I Need You. If you know it, you can sing with us. Don't be afraid to sing from out there. Don't sing too loud because we'll recruit you for choir if you don't want to be up here. But maybe that's okay too. And this is a prayer. This is an offering. This, prayer, this, this song is an offering. We can't always give a lot. Our family can't always give a lot, but we can always give our offerings of praise. And we can give those from the heart and we can give those with everything we have. Lord, I need you.
We're going to sing one of those, as Brother Brian likes to call them, a new hymn. They're still writing hymns today. Right now we call them praise choruses. In about 20 years, they're going to call them hymns. So we're going we're gonna to beat them to it. We're going to beat them to the chase. We're going to sing, There's a Fountain, and it's got a, new, it's got a new arrangement to it, but we're going to invite you to sing with us.
Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Thank you so much, Lori. I know you all are thinking you just never know what that guy's going to come out with. But you're going to have to wait on this one till later to figure out. Now, I mean, you can figure out what it is. It's animal crackers, but what's it got to do with anything? That you're going to have to wait on. Please turn with me to Malachi, the third chapter. We're going to be finishing up our series on the minor prophets today. And uh, we'll be moving into uh, 1 John next week, uh, not only out here, but also in our Sunday school program. And let me just say, if you're not enrolled in a Bible uh, study, uh, Sunday school class, we meet at 10 minutes till 9 every Sunday morning. And we're starting a new quarter where we're going to be studying 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then the book of Revelation will be our study this summer. So get involved. You can come out to the one that... Uh, uh, I'm involved in out in the gym or find some friends of yours and go to their Sunday school class. We'll all be studying uh, the same thing. Evangelist and pastor Greg Laurie told the story of an older lady. And since older is relative, I'm not going to share what her age was. But an older lady uh, was a little fearful. And so she decided to uh, do the training and get a concealed carry permit. And then she bought a pistol to carry in her purse in case she ever was accosted by someone. So she went to the grocery store one day, and she had her bags in her hand, and she came out to find her car, and she came up to the car, and there were four men sitting in it. She put her bags down. She reached in her purse, took her gun out, assumed the position, and said, 
You guys get out of my car. I have a gun and I know how to use it. Those four guys jumped out of the car and ran like crazy. And so she loaded up her uh, uh, groceries and she sat down and put her key in the ignition and it didn't work. <laughs> she looked around. It wasn't her car. Her car looked just like it, four, four places down, so she knew what she had to do. She got her groceries out, put them in her car, got in her car and went to the police station to turn herself in. She goes up to the sergeant at the desk, and she says, I just want to tell you what I've done. And when she told him what she had done, the sergeant just about fell off of his chair <laughs> because there were four guys on the other end of the counter saying, we've been car jacked by an old woman with thick glasses, curly white hair, less than five feet tall with a big hunking gun. <laughs> no charges were filed. But here's the point. She thought it was her car, but it really belonged to somebody else. Today, we're going to be in Malachi 3. And I want you to know that that's our problem with money. We think the money that we have belongs to us. It doesn't. Everything, every good gift comes from God. Your ability to have money in your wallet comes from the blessing of God. So when people think that it's theirs, then they become possessive. But if it all belongs to God, he gives it to us as a test to see how we're going to manage it. In other words, let me, let me put it in a way I could even understand it. God has called us to be stewards of his stuff. And it's all his stuff. So we're going to look at Malachi, the third chapter. This is a, a part of the scripture that we didn't study in Sunday school this morning. But we're going to focus on uh, more today. And uh, we're going to look at a message entitled, What Does the Bible Teach About the Blessing of Tithing? Beginning with verse 8, God's word says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you today understanding that this particular passage of Scripture was speaking to the Israelites, but has application to us today. Help us, Father, to love you. Help us, Father, to love you in such a way that we will be obedient to all of your laws and all of the things that you've asked of us. Lord, help us to be good stewards, good managers of that which you have uh, given us to manage. And I pray, Father, that as you speak this message, that you will open our hearts and our minds and not just think, oh, it's another message on money, but that it is a message of how to be right with you. If there's somebody here, Lord, that's never asked you to be their Lord and Savior, may today be the day that they get right with you in that area. Lord, you may be calling some folks today in this place to join this family of believers, and I pray, Father, if that's the case, that you will bless them with the courage to do what you've called them to do. Father, whatever it is we need to do to get right with you today, tell us and let us say what all good servants say when asked to do something. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to begin by uh, talking about what does the Bible teach about tithing? And then I'm going to get specific into this passage. Now, to give you a little bit of background of this particular passage, Israel was accused by God of being thieves. Thievery against people is bad enough. But could you imagine anybody trying to rob God of that which is his? Surely God's chosen people, whom he had done so much for, wouldn't rob God. Yet that was the charge. 
And they ask, in what way have we robbed you? It's kind of like when you get stopped by a policeman. Some of you are policemen, and, and you've heard this over and over and over again in your job. You, know, you get stopped by a policeman, and first thing you say is, what did I do wrong, officer? You know what you did wrong, you know? It's like, it's like the officer comes up to you and says, well, you know, you were speeding, you ran a red light, and you nearly hit a pedestrian, you know? I mean, you know. And so they ask him, well, what, how have we robbed you, God? He says, in tithes and offerings. In Malachi 1, if you were here, uh, he talked about the quality of the offering and the sacrifice that they were bringing. They were not bringing their best into the master. They were bringing their worst, some stuff that they didn't even want to the master. And that was not right. Today, we're talking about the quantity. Uh, some people ask me, they say, well, Brother Bob, how often do you speak about tithing and offerings? And I tell them, I preach about it every time it comes up in Scripture. Because as you all well know, I preach through books of the Bible. And when it comes up, and you may be thinking, well, how many times does he talk about money? Well, Larry Burkett, before he died, uh, he founded Crown Financial Ministries. And uh, before he became that guy, he uh, was a businessman and he led a Bible study. And he came in one day after studying the Word of God and he told his class that there were over a hundred verses about money in the Bible. And someone responded to him and argued with him and said, well, God's not interested in the subject of our money. So he went back and studied some more and came back the next time in class and said, I found 700 verses in the Bible. And now if you go on Crown Ministries, they've done a, a complete check and there are 2,350 verses on finances and possessions in the Bible. God obviously is concerned and cares about our view of his stuff. So let me just give you kind of a biblical basis before we get down into this passage for giving. Number one, God owns everything. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 says, The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundations on the seas and established it on the rivers. So that's the first thing that you need to understand about finances and possessions. It all belongs to God. Number two, God entrusts us to manage portions of what he owns. And he calls us to be good stewards, or, or that's a biblical word that means manager of, or one who is a caretaker of. God entrusts us to manage portions of what he owns, and then we're evaluated on that. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. You may be thinking, well, you know, I worked real hard for that wealth. He gave you the job. He gave you the talents and ability to make whatever it is you make. And as you manage according to his principles, then there's blessings that come along with that. The third biblical basis for giving that's in the Bible as a, as a, a whole God expects us to listen to him about where to allocate the portions that he has given us charge of. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He is saying that what we do with our money and our possession reveals our real priorities. It's that simple. How we manage God's stuff is a spiritual thermometer, a way to measure what's really going on in our heart with God. Billy Graham said this, a checkbook is a theological document. It will tell you who and what you worship. Ooh, ooh, Billy the Graham. I mean, you know, that's pretty tough. Pretty tough. Of course, I'd have to change it to debit report now, you know, because we all, you know, so many use debit cards and, and things like that. But it's all the same thing. Well, let's just start with the command, Malachi 3.10, the first part. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Now, there are those who argue today, since we live in the age of grace, we are not bound by the law. And guess what? I agree with that. Tithing is not a legal requirement for Christians. But in Matthew 5.20 it says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what did he say to the scribes and Pharisees? Luke 11.42 says, But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe, 
mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done. In other words, yeah, you should have tithed without leaving the others undone. In other words, you should tithe with the right attitude and actions as well. Adrian Rogers said this, If Jews under the law gave a tithe, should Christians under grace give less? Any Christian who would let an Old Testament Jew do more under the law than he will do under grace is a disgrace to grace. And if you're using grace as a reason to give less, than a tithe, then you better check your spiritual pulse because there's a spiritual problem there. W.A. Criswell uh, had a young man come into his office and uh, he was talking to him about a sermon that he preached on tithing. And, and the young man said, uh, uh, he said, uh, he said, Pastor Criswell, he said, I make about $40 a week right now. I, I, I need a job. I need, now, I've been tithing on that, Pastor. I've been tithing 10%. I've been tithing $4 every week. And Pastor Criswell said, well, I'll pray for you. And so a couple of years went by, three years went by, about five years went by, about 10 years went by, and this young man became very, very successful. He was so successful that he was making so much money that his tithe was $500 a week comes back in to talk to the pastor and says, Pastor Criswell, he said, I've just seen, is there any way I can be re released from my tithing uh, promise? He said, that's a lot of money to give. Pastor Criswell said, well, I don't see how you can be released from your promise, but I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll pray right now and we'll ask God to reduce your income back to $40 a week so you'll have no problem tithing that $4 again. As you might imagine, that young uh, pastor, uh, I mean, that young uh, uh, person was not too excited about that kind of pastoral prayer. But it would be a good prayer because let me say something to you. To be right with God, you need to be right in the area of giving. And I'm not preaching this so you'll give more money to me because what you give won't matter, you know, uh, to, to what much I make. That's, that's a whole different thing. I don't just take a handful out of the plate every week. I mean, that's not the way it works. I am preaching this to you, number one, because it's in God's Word, and number two, because it's one of the ways you are right with God. If you are not right with God in the areas of finances, you are not right with God. And I, I have dealt with that in my own life, and you must deal with it in your life. Well, let me give you some uh, other passages of scripture quickly that's in the Bible as a whole you may say well, what does the New Testament say about giving well in 1 Corinthians 16 2 Paul wrote on the first day of every week each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income in 2 Corinthians 9 6 and 7 it says for, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So basically, what Paul was teaching is we are to give regularly, individually, systematically, proportionately, bountifully, and cheerfully. That's a whole lot of leaves, but they all work there, and they come out of that passage. The principle of the New Testament is to give voluntarily to support the needs of others, support Christian workers, and expand Christian outreach. No specific amount is ever given or commanded in the, in the New Testament. While a tithe or a tenth of one's finance may be a good standard to use for Christian giving, it's clear the early church did not focus on a specific amount but rather on meeting needs. This sometimes included giving much more than a tenth. Some uh, estimates of the Jewish giving was that if you count the tithes and the offerings, they gave about 30% of their, uh, what they made to the Lord. So the goal, in summary, one should seek God in what he would have you to give. But I'm going to tell you it'll never be less than a tithe because a tithe is 10% of what you make, and it is an act of worship. You worship by saying, I am giving you this for the work of the kingdom to let you know that I know that it all belongs to you and that you want me to have charge of this 90%, and you are going to evaluate me on the day of judgment on how I managed your stuff. Wow, didn't get an amen on that one. But that's just still the truth, whether I do or not. 
Your level of gratefulness to God for what he has done can be measured by your giving. I like a percentage because a, I call a percentage an equitable giving. Because whether you make a dollar or whether you make a, a million dollars, 10% is an equitable sacrifice. And so I use that in my own life. 10% comes to God as an act of worship, and then offerings come as God leads me above my tithe. Uh, so if God cannot bless the 90% to go further than the 100%, then how can we believe he has the power to create a world, save our souls, or prepare a place for us in heaven? Let me, re let me repeat that. I'm afraid you might miss that. If God cannot bless the 90 cent to go further than 100%, then how can we believe he has the power to create a world, save our souls, or prepare a place for us in heaven? There was a pastor one time, uh, a man came and, and was talking to him, and he said, uh, Pastor said, I just don't see how I can give this much to the Lord because I, 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 can't, I, I just can't cover all my bills. And the pastor said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. What if you for one month gave what God has asked you to give back to him? And let's say if, you can't, if, you, if any of your bills are overdue or something, I'll make them up for you. I'll make them up for you for a month. You just try it for four weeks. Just try God. It says here in this passage, test me, try me, and just see how it works out. And the young man, he said, would you be willing to do that? And the young man looked at him and said, yeah, if, you, if you'll make up the difference, I, I'll do that. And the pastor looked at him and smiled. Let me tell you what he said to him. Well, what do you think about that? You say you'd be willing to trust a mere man like me who possesses so little materially, but you can't trust your heavenly Father who owns the whole universe to make up the difference of what you need to give? The young man decided to give regularly, and God was faithful to meet his needs. If a person's faith is real, evidence will abound. We have so much to be grateful for. And the real question we need to ask is, God, how do you want me to manage the stuff that you've given me charge of? J.L. Kraft of Kraft Foods gave about 25% of his enormous income to Christian causes. So whenever you pick up something from Kraft, the founder, I don't know how it runs now, but the founder gave about 25% of everything that he made to the Lord. He said this, the only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I have given to the Lord. So let's look at the blessing of tithing. What does the Bible say about the blessing of tithing? And that's kind of where I want to move into here because God literally dared them to see what would happen if they were obedient in the area of giving. And I think there are applications from this passage of Malachi that can help us as, as Christians today under the age of grace in how we should expect God to react to our giving. What blessings were promised to the Israelites if they were right with God concerning their giving? Number one, if you manage what I place under your authority in agreement with my management principles, you will be blessed. That's just what he said. Look at the second part of Malachi 3.10. says, The Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. Well, now to my little... Let's pretend... Now, all we had was animal crackers, and, but uh, let's pretend that this is all candy, okay? Back in the days... Some of you can go back this far. Back in the days of the old country store, this is how they kept candy, right? It'd be a big old box of candy. And so this little boy would come in. He wasn't very old. He was, you know five, six, maybe seven, uh, would come in there. And, and every time the, the store manager said, well, you've been such a good boy today. Here, you just reach your hand in there and take out a handful of candy. And the little boy was shy, and he would put his head down, you know. Go ahead, reach in and take a handful of candy. And he you know, just go like that. And so the store manager would reach in and grab a handful and hand it to the little boy. And he'd take it and say, thank you. And then he would walk out. And his mother said to him, he said, why is it every time we go in there and the store manager says that you can reach in there and take a handful of candy, 
but you always get shy. And he said, Mom, his hand's bigger than mine. <laughs> you know what? God's hand's bigger than yours, too. And if he says that you are to give to him, and he says, I'm going to open up the windows, and I am going to pour out my blessings, what kind of pouring is that going to be? It's not going to be a sprinkling. It's not going to be, uh, uh, you know, partly cloudy that day. We're going to have a downpour of blessings because that's how God operates. If you manage what I place under your authority in agreement with my management principles, you will be blessed. But Further than that, notice what he says in verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer of your, for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Host, if you manage what I place under your authority in agreement with my management principles, you will not only be blessed, but you will be protected. Because it talks here, he says, look, I'm going to take care of the devourer, and he's not going to be able to mess with your, with your uh, produce. Because they weren't dealing as much with money as they were uh, livestock and, uh, and, and, and harvest. So that was their way of, of, of giving during that time. For those of you who have been faithful in giving, how many times can you remember the protection and favor from God at just the right time? Maybe, maybe uh, everybody was being laid off and you got transferred to a job where you actually could keep working. Or, or maybe uh, uh, just when you thought you, you didn't have any money at all, a bonus or something special came in that God blessed you because you were faithful. In my own life, I, I remember a time that uh, I'd been pastoring for about 12 years and my friend Fred Winters, of course, who uh, got shot and killed while he was preaching, had asked me to come and, and serve with him as an associate pastor for a while during a big growth spurt that they were having. And I, I really prayed hard about that because I thought, you know, Lord, I, I've always been the pastor, not an associate pastor. And I'm thinking, why, why would you have me do this? But I knew it was God, and so I went. I was obedient to the Lord. I did what he said, and it wasn't long after that that my son, who was about 11 years old, got diabetes. And he needed my attention because I'm a diabetic as well. And I spent time with him while he was in the hospital. They kept him, and I stayed by his side. And I remember the first shot that my son ever gave was into my leg to practice. And I was able to minister to him. I also remember that uh, I was just a few hours away from finishing one of my seminary degrees and during that time period I had time to finish the degrees that I needed to finish and God knew what I needed in advance he knew I needed that time period to be in a position where I could do other things rather than the the things that need to be done by the person who's preparing all the sermons and I look back on it in hindsight and I realized that I was protected and prepared for the next phase that eventually brought me right here to be with all of you that I love so much as your pastor. If you manage what I place under your authority in agreement with my management principles, you will be blessed, you will be protected, and you will be a witness. Listen to what it says in Matthew 3.12. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land. You see, a witness that a relationship with God leads to blessing and delight is what the world needs to see. Not only will others call you blessed, but they will be right. When Israel was right with God, they became a blessing to other nations of the world. You know what? You remember when we were the missionary uh, country of the world? You remember where we were pouring out Christian missionaries all over the world? You know, when we were doing that, God blessed this nation. And when we turn our backs on that as a nation, Will we be blessed as a nation? I don't know. I think that to be blessed, you have to be blessable and obedient. A delightsome land, in one of the translations, rather than a delightful land, it's a delightsome land. Literally, a land of good pleasure. A land which in God is well pleased. A land fulfilling their purpose through relationship with a loving and generous God toward his obedient people. All of this leads us to the primary use for our money. We are to use all he has given us to manage 
to bring him glory out of love and gratefulness for his wonderful grace. Let me share with you a personal uh, illustration that might help you to kind of understand the basis that we should have for giving, the motivation. Yeah, we could be motivated by being blessed. We could motiv- be motivated by being protected. We could be motivated by the fact that when we are in good relationship with God, it is a great witness to the world around us. But there's one more thing that I think we need to take count of. You know, some y- young men's strategy over the Christmas season is to break up with all girlfriends. So they don't have to buy them Christmas presents, Right? And then they reconcile after Christmas and then they, you know, until their birthday, and then they break. It's not a good plan, but it's prevalent in our society today. Well, I remember one Christmas, I uh, was still in high school, and, and I was looking at a piece of jewelry for a girlfriend that I was very much trying to impress. The lady at the counter showed me a necklace, and I looked at it, and I thought, well, that's just right. That's exactly. And, and then she said, oh, but... You can't just buy the necklace. You've got to buy the bracelet and the earrings that go with it. And she said, if you really love her. I looked at her and said, money is no object. <laughs> money was an object. I only worked some part-time jobs. I didn't have any, any money hardly at all. But I said, I'll take the whole set. Because in that moment, money was no object because I was in love. Later on, I had a girlfriend that, uh, uh, well, I was in my senior year, actually, and, and uh, we were dating, and I went to college half a day, and she wanted to go to college half a day, too. So she went to another school, so she said, but I don't have a car. Well, I'll come pick you up over lunch hour. I'll take you there, and then I'll take you, take you back home, you know. And yes, it costs some gas money and wear and tear on the car, but money was no object because I was in love. Well, <laughs> I've often wondered if that girlfriend at Christmas time still had that necklace I wonder if she's kept that necklace all over these years and I wondered if it meant anything to her that I got her that uh, necklace way back then so I asked her this morning if uh, (laughs) and she said yes I do You thought I was digging myself in a hole, didn't you? (laughs) I noticed a few of you drop your head and start to pray for me. (laughs) But you know what I really thank God for today? I thank God that my girlfriend today, my wife, is a frugal penny pincher. Because when it comes to her, money is still no object because I'm still in love with her. There is a point to this illustration. What was the problem with the people in Malachi's day? They had lost their first love. You see, when we're not right with God in our giving, we got a love problem. A love problem. And Jesus, when he talked to the church in Ephesus, he said, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love, Revelation 2, 4. So how is that love restored? Jesus said in Revelation 2, 5, Remember the height from which you have fallen. The key word is remember. When we remember how Christ bled and died on the cross for our sins and all the other wonderful provisions he has given us, his blessing, his protection, and the fact that he wants us to be his witnesses. We need to appreciate him and love him because when we are right with God, money will be no object because we are in love with Jesus and he is worthy of our love. He is worthy of our devotion. And I tell you what, folks, he double-dog dared you 
to try him on this. He said, try me on this. Bring it in. Try me on this. He double-dog dare you because before, you know what a double-dog dare is, don't you? That means you've got to do it first. You know what he gave for you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You've been double dog dared. Now it's your turn to be obedient and right with God. Let's bow our heads because you see the first step in responding to what you need to give to the Lord is to give yourself to him. Forget the money thing. You need to give yourself. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Confessing him as Lord means you are giving him all rights to you, your body, your thoughts, your uh, uh, life. So that's the first step. Give of yourself to the master. So you can do that right now. Here's how you do it. You ask him to forgive you of your sins. You say to him in a word of prayer that I am going to stop doing things my way. I'm going to stop being my own boss, but I'm going, to, I'm going to give that over to you, Lord. I'm going to let you be the boss of my life. I'm going to turn from my way of doing things to your way of doing things. That's biblically repentance, turning from your way to his way and asking him to forgive you of your sins. The second step is believing in him. Believing that if he says how to be right with him in the area of giving, that you're going to be right with him in the area of giving. That, that's what the Lord said, just do it. But I'll tell you what, if you do do that, you believe in him and trust his word, he will always give you more than you could have ever imagined. And then the confession of him as Lord, which we've already talked about. Just say, I want you to be my boss, and I, want, I pray that you will send your Holy Spirit to come live in my body so that my body will be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Please save me right now. First step in being right with God is giving yourself to him. And then the point of the message today was giving him what God has laid upon your heart to give. My first tithing experience was on ten dollars I make a little more now but I still make sure that I honor and worship God by giving him what is his out of worship you may need to be right with God in that area I'm not telling you that because I want more money because I'm not going to get more money if it comes in it's between you and God to be right with him and there may be some things going on in your life right now that are absolutely wrong because you have removed yourself from the blessing of God. You're asking him to bless you and he's asking you to be right with him. So get right with him right now. Father, I come to you as your messenger today. Lord, the name Malachi means messenger and he wasn't too popular when he preached this message way back when. And I may not be too popular as people hear me preach on this today but it's still the truth and Lord you've called me as your messenger to help people know how to be right with God by giving ourselves and giving the portion of that which you have given us to manage back to you for your kingdom purposes so that you can bless the 90% so that you can protect so that we can be a witness to you so Father Thy will be done in our hearts and minds as thy will is done in heaven. And if anybody needs to make a decision today, Lord, I pray that you will give them the courage to be right with you before they leave here today. In Jesus' name, amen.